Hi dudes, my name is Tiffany. Welcome back to my series, Internet Analysis. I make all kinds of videos. Today I wanted to talk about the very intense pressures and competition of being in high school and preparing for college. Clearly I have not come up with a concise title yet. Anyway, I've been thinking a lot about education recently. I made a video a couple weeks ago about tech in schools and kind of like the privilege of either having tech or being so privileged that you don't have tech. I don't know, watch the video, it's interesting. But then my last video was about hustle culture and toxic productivity, and a lot of the people in the comments said that that reminded them of the pressure to succeed and constantly be busy and doing things in school, whether that is high school or college. So I was inspired by your comments and wanted to make this video. So in this video, I am gonna focus on high school's workload, and then in the future, Hopefully in the next week or so, I will make a video focused on the college lack of work-life balance. So yeah, in my last video, I talked about how adults in the workforce are pretty overworked and they are constantly feeling this pressure to be productive and we feel guilty when we're not working. And yeah, I totally agree that students feel pressured in those similar ways as well, especially with the hyper-competitive college admissions process. So in this video, I wanna discuss the expectations that students feel that they have to meet in order to create this kind of perfect, impressive college application Application, as well as the potential dangers of overextending yourself. So generally, the pressure to go to college is everywhere. A lot of students are told that the only way that they will be successful is to at least get a bachelor's degree, and I have always been really frustrated by that. I've never believed that. It's just not true that you have to go to college to be successful. Plus, we've seen that having a bachelor's, though it's required by a lot of jobs, does not guarantee that you'll be able to necessarily get a good paying job. Which brings me to the sponsor of this part of today's video, which is a Amino. I am doing an ongoing partnership with them because I'm creating a series on their app, which is called Life After High School. And the premise is basically this. I don't believe that you necessarily have to go to a four year or you don't have to go right away in order to be successful. So I've made episodes about gap years, community college, trade schools. And this week's episode is about rejection because I'm just a big believer in the fact that there are many different paths to success and everybody's journey is gonna look different. A few years ago I wanted to transfer colleges so I sent applications to about 10 schools and I ended up being rejected by every single one. Rejected by all colleges, not clickbait. So I definitely encourage you guys to check out Amino. You can download the app and then if you look up Tiffany Ferg you will find me and you can follow me and see all of my episodes there. So getting right back into it, let's discuss what is expected of a student in order to be competitive in college applications. And by the way this is coming from an American American perspective. That's all that I'm familiar with, but I do know that these kind of intense pressures are pretty common in a lot of other places, and some places even have more intense schooling and college cultures, so I'm sure a lot of you can relate, unfortunately. But anyway, the basic goals are to maintain the highest possible GPA, take as many advanced, honors, AP, IB courses as possible, and of course, join many extracurriculars such as clubs, sports, volunteering, to prove that you are well-rounded. It's just wild because college admissions are getting more selective literally every year. The most selective colleges are just becoming more and more and more selective. It's truly mind-boggling how many applications are submitted to top schools these days. And even state schools get so many applications. But anyway, even for top students with top grades and great extracurriculars, acceptances are far from guaranteed. So every student experiences stress and different pressures to succeed, but I think everybody has a different vision of what success means to them. For a lot of people, college represents the chance for upward social mobility. In the last video, we talked about the American dream. This is similar. This is definitely a big part of it because college can give you opportunities that you wouldn't have otherwise. But still, a lot of factors come into play when it comes to college admissions and kind of your ability to succeed in high school in the ways that these applications want you to. It's no secret that your family's income level or where you live can have a big impact on your abilities to be a compelling, competitive college applicant. It is not just about working hard because unfortunately there just are not not equal opportunities for all students. Depending on your socioeconomic situation, you would face 
different obstacles that maybe some other students with different privileges don't have to face. Let's give some examples. Consider a low-income minority student who goes to an urban school that's maybe lacking in funding and resources. For that student, statistically speaking, even just graduating high school would be a pretty big challenge, let alone getting into colleges and then actually being able to afford to go. Now compare that to a student in a wealthy area who goes to a well-funded public school or even a private school that specializes in college prep, that student would probably be under immense pressure as well. But again, different types of pressure. Most likely at least one of their parents is college educated. So it's always probably been part of their life plan for their child to go to college. For a student like this, their expectations are probably, I need to graduate at the top of my class and I need to go to an elite, super selective university. So another example, let me explain my perspective and my upbringing. I grew up in Southern Orange County, California, which is a pretty affluent area, though I was low income, which is gonna be relevant later. The public schools were always really great, especially my high school. I have always been a good student. I've always been a really good test taker. I took the GATE, Gifted and Talented Education test in second grade. And I would actually like to make a whole video about that subject of like being a gifted student and kind of what that label does to you because uh, some of us are kind of messed up. I actually have a podcast also, which is called Previously Gifted, and that comes from that sort of concept where your whole identity is based around you being labeled as a gifted student, and then you grow up and realize maybe you're not that gifted. Anyway, if you guys want to listen to my podcast, you should check it out. It's a very much less scripted version of myself, so I am not this eloquent. <laughs> if you think I'm eloquent, maybe you don't. Anyway, for me, academics were always my strength. But on the other hand, I didn't really have any hobbies other than YouTube, which I started when I was like 11, which is crazy. And I never played any sports. So again, being good at school was like my thing, my only thing. And I didn't have to try that hard. So yes, I was that asshole who could not really study for a test and still get an A. When it came to college, I always assumed that I would go because I was one of those advanced AP students, but my parents didn't go to college and they were never really involved in my education. Like they never had to tell me to do my homework. I was always on top of it myself. But being a first generation college student, the first in my family to pursue a four year degree, I had to figure all of that out myself. Anyway, I hope that my personal perspective gives some context, but I feel like I kind of have an interesting midpoint between yes, being in an affluent area with the benefits of a good school system, but also having that experience of being a first generation college student and being low income and yeah. Anyway, I just wanna emphasize how crazy it is, I think, to expect that all students should be perfect students, they should excel academically in these standardized tests, but also at the same time, you have to be well-rounded you have to have interests in sports and extracurriculars and have this perfect balance of whatever college board and colleges want you to have. You can't just focus on academics, though your academics better be top notch or you're not gonna have any chance to get into these schools. It's like, okay, what do you want from me? I'm only one person. The expectations and standards are just nearly impossible, even for the best students who don't have to try that hard. To balance all the other factors is just too much. So that's one element of this video that we're gonna be talking about, just the utter absurdity of these expectations and how it just keeps getting worse year after year. But also the other element I wanna talk about is access. The fact that all of these things that can contribute to a student being a better applicant are not accessible to everyone. And of course there are different levels of privilege that make it easier for somebody else to accomplish these things or to have access to these things, such as SAT prep or AP courses. The ridiculous hoops we make college applicants jump through. Somehow at the tender age of 16, 17, or 18, they are expected to be critical scholars and outstanding athletes and skilled artists and public servants. Most of the students I know fit at least one of these criteria. Many fit two or more. None fits them all. So they fake it, and that's just not right. So let's talk about where this pressure to succeed comes from, because sometimes it is from the student. I would say in my own situation, the pressure did come from myself, but again, academics were all I had, so my eggs were in one basket. Usually it's a combination of pressure coming from a lot of different places at once, a little bit of pressure from yourself, pressure from good old society, and then of course, 
pressure from your parents. And for example, I would like to talk about tiger moms. It's like tough. Overbearing. Strict as hell. I think of my mom. My mom? I had a tiger mom, 100%. A tiger mom is an Asian American mom that holds her kids to really, really high standards. The most important thing is being smart and doing well in school. Always pushing you to be excellent. Actually, they expect more than the best from you. They, they, they have an ideal of what you should be, and you should meet or beat it. If it's an A minus, why don't you get an A? Um, or if I got 100%, she'd be like, Did, was there no extra credit? So obviously, Asian Americans are not the only students who have super strict parents who are very, let's say, involved in their schooling. But I think that serves as a good example of the level of dedication and commitment and excellence that is expected from a lot of students these days. Now I want to break down the elements of a college application and dive a little bit deeper. So first let's talk about GPA, grade point average. So obviously GPA is a huge factor in college admissions, and these days AP classes are pretty much the key to being able to get ultra high GPAs. In case you don't know, let me explain how APs work. AP stands for Advanced Placement Courses. You take the courses and then you can take AP tests. And if you get above a three out of five on the test, then you get college credit for these courses. So in a typical GPA scale, it's out of four, 4.0. But APs have changed the unweighted scale to a weighted 5.0 scale because an A in an AP class is worth a five and a B in an AP class is worth a four and so on. So if you get A's in AP classes, that can help raise your GPA above a four. I'm editing this like, was it worth it for me to take the time to explain this? I don't know. So now, top students don't aim for a 4.0 unweighted like we used to. We, that wasn't even me. Who, I don't know. Again, it's midnight and I'm already loopy. These days, top students aim to get their GPAs as close to 5.0 as possible, which is absolutely crazy. You have to take like over 10 AP classes and get A's in them to be able to get your GPA that high. It's absolutely mind blowing. For reference and maybe for humble bragging, I guess, I took six APs in high school, which I thought was a decent amount. I did pass all of my tests with fours and fives. So I've gotten college credit for those. And I ended high school with a little over a 4.0 weighted. But the funny thing is, I'm proud of those stats, but nowadays, like, that's nothing. I've spent a lot of time on, like, College Confidential throughout my transfer journey, and people will post their stats, like their GPA, weighted, unweighted, the number of APs they took, all of their other information, and it is just crazy how competitive it is. These days, taking six APs would not be enough. Like, as many APs as your school offers, you better be taking that many, basically. But anyway, that's pretty cool, you know? A great chance to be able to bump up your GPA, but the thing is that access to AP courses is very unequal. For example, one high school may offer five AP courses and another might offer 15. Therefore, of course, the students at those schools would have very different opportunities to take those numbers of AP classes. So they would have different opportunities to be able to raise their GPAs on a 5.0 weighted scale. But also access to AP courses is often elusive for low income students. As you can see here, there are a lot less low income students in AP classes. And that comes down to a lot of reasons, but perhaps one reason could be that AP exams are pretty expensive. They are $94 per exam without fees. Though many schools do have financial aid and fee waivers for low income students, but still, say you're not low income enough to qualify for the waiver, it can still be very expensive to take these courses. Again, kids are taking many of these courses and those fees add up really quickly. Last fall, the average freshman admitted to UC Berkeley and UCLA had a weighted high school GPA greater than a 4.0 because they got good grades in honors and advanced placement courses. Again, those help to raise your GPA above a 4.0. But in addition to the income gap in AP courses, there's also a race gap. 
Black, Hispanic, and Native American students are less likely to attend high schools that offer advanced courses, such as physics and calculus, and they're also less likely to participate in those courses when they are offered. The students who actually take college prep courses and pass them are disproportionately affluent, white, or Asian. But there's also another element of this, which is grade inflation, and I didn't really know about this, though I feel like I did kind of suspect it. So basically, because mainly wealthy, mainly white parents want their kids to do well and get good grades, they're basically forcing their schools or pressuring their schools to give their kids better grades. Or they are intentionally choosing schools that they know are more generous, so to speak, in their grading. This blew my mind. Half of American teenagers now graduate with an A average. I feel like that can't be possible. Those enrolled in private and suburban public high schools are being awarded higher grades than their urban public school counterparts with no less talent or potential. It's that grade inflation is accelerating in schools attended by higher income Americans who are much more likely than their lower income peers to be white. This is just another systemic disadvantage that we put in front of low income kids and kids of color. So if you look at this graph, for example, you can see a big gap between the GPAs specifically at private schools, religious schools, and then suburban public schools. If you look at the urban public schools, the GPAs have kind of stayed the same over the past 18 years. But the interesting thing, as it notes, is that the average high school GPAs of students have risen, but the same students' SAT scores have gone down, not up. So that would, again, suggest that they're getting higher grades, but they're not necessarily performing better, at least in the standardized, you know, SAT testing. To be attractive to parents, private schools in particular, need to be able to tout how many of their students went to selective colleges, so they're incentivized to give better grades. People say that a 3.8 is stronger than a 3.6, but all things aren't equal. The tough thing is it's hard for colleges when they're looking at these applications to be able to tell exactly where grade inflation is happening. Because they have so many applications to look at, they can't sit and think, oh, this school tends to give out higher than average GPAs, maybe there's grade inflation involved. I'm not even saying words. They don't really have the time to consider that, so they basically take it at face value, which lets these kids benefit from their inflated grades, while the other students who are not getting inflated grades are suffering because they have lower GPAs on paper. But also, even if they did have the capacity to look more deeply into the records, universities are rewarded by college rankings for accepting applicants whose GPAs are highest. So similarly to why private schools would be incentivized to have higher GPA students, the colleges are kind of like, well, it makes us rank higher. <laughs> I love corruption. So obviously GPA is hyper competitive and in a lot of situations, very unfair. Let's keep going. The thing is, I'm not trying to say that these kids aren't working hard. I think most students are working really hard, but it is clear that certain students are getting a bit of a break or a bit of an advantage or privilege. And then there are other students, primarily minorities or low income students that are not getting these benefits and therefore have to work even harder just to keep up with those standards. Now let's talk about standardized testing and the privilege of college prep. I would like to make a video all about standardized testing because I think it's fascinating and kind of ruins everybody. But again, another topic for another time. Another major factor of college admissions are SAT and or ACT scores. The significance of these tests has been questioned a little bit recently, but still most colleges do factor these into admission. Some would argue that these tests matter a little bit less about actual knowledge and more about knowing how to take the test. So if you can take an SAT prep class or an ACT prep class, they will teach you kind of what the test is looking for or how you're supposed to think to be able to do well on the test. So obviously, if you don't take those courses, you're automatically at a disadvantage because you don't already have those tips on how to take the tests. And of course, these SAT and ACT prep courses are usually not free and I would bet that they are pretty pricey. The thing is also that a lot of students, or I guess parents, put their kids into these prep courses even years before they start high school. So you get years and years and years of practice so that you can perform well on these tests. So obviously, if you have the resources, AKA money, to be able to take these prep courses, you will pretty much be very likely to do a lot better on these tests than anyone who didn't have access to those resources. 
These more privileged students probably also take the PSAT and then they're more likely to take the SAT or ACT more than once, which again gives them more chances to raise their scores. And these tests are expensive. To take the SAT or ACT, it can cost roughly between $50 to $65, depending on if you wanna take the versions with essays. There are also additional SAT subject tests and I think ACT subject tests. I'm not familiar, I only took the ACT. SAT, what am I saying? And you might be able to get fee waivers, again, if you qualify as a low-income student. But again, for those kind of lower middle class students who aren't low-income enough to be low-income, they can still be really pricey. To somebody who's more wealthy, you know, 50 or 60 bucks a pop means nothing. And now it's time to talk about extracurriculars. This is your chance to prove that you're a well-rounded student. You're not just good academically. You also love clubs. Maybe you've joined student council. Maybe you're in a sport or two or three. Maybe you're in band. Students are also highly expected to volunteer. And I was looking at some information. This says, as a rough guideline, anything between 50 and 200 hours is gonna sound impressive and show that you've made a commitment. However, once you get above 200 hours, you should maybe spend your time doing something else. The thing is, a lot of hours volunteering is not gonna be enough. You still need to be the full package. I hate that language. I hate thinking of students and people as packages, these perfect packages, the full package, as if not having enough hours or extracurriculars makes you less of a person. <laughs> I'm disappointed with the system. But here's the thing, I know personally a lot of students from my high school who, let's say, garnished their extracurriculars because they knew that they had to make their college applications look good. And that is always the purpose of people doing extracurriculars. I mean, yes, people genuinely do enjoy a few activities, but sometimes they feel compelled to do as many as possible to make their application look good. It looks good on your application, so you better do it. I even heard of people creating clubs and then making themselves like president of that club and the club would only have like one meeting a year, but they did all of that just for the sake of putting it on their college apps. We love a scammer. But anyway, I always hated this idea of being compelled to do all of these activities just for the sake of making your college apps look good. First of all, I had a job, I had to work. As soon as I turned 16, I got a job. I worked at least 20 hours a week you know, sophomore through senior year. And I know that that's not even the most amount of hours that some people work. Some people are working before school and then after school and long hours on the weekends. And again, that's in addition to all of the academic work that you have to do. And teachers, you know, assign homework and reading as if you have nothing else to do <laughs> in your spare time. It is truly crazy the amount of time and energy. That's another thing that you have to consider mental and physical energy in trying to balance all of these things. But anyway, extracurriculars are another situation where you're at a disadvantage if you are a student that needs a job. Let's say you need money to pay for things that you need, or you work to give money back to your own family. All of those hours that you spend working at a job are hours that you can't spend on extracurriculars that make your applications look good. And you can put your work under your extracurriculars, but again, that's only like one line instead of adding all of those other things that kind of fluff up your application. Unfortunately, I don't think that colleges look at work extracurriculars as very impressive, which it's pretty frustrating. On the other hand though, I do wanna mention that for a lot of students who maybe aren't the strongest academically, your extracurriculars can kind of save you and again, kind of boost up your college applications and give you a better advantage. For example, my little brother, he goes to UC Santa Barbara and he had a good GPA, but not like above a 4.0, but he had tons of extracurriculars and he's truly like, he's that kid who does want to actually be involved in everything. And I really think that that was a big impactful part of his application that helped him get accepted. So sometimes they can be good, but again, I don't like this obligation to do so many different activities just for the sake of making your application look good. If you enjoy it, if you genuinely want to do it, I totally respect that. I respect student athletes. They put in so much work, you know, people in theater, drama, band, all kinds of activities. It takes a lot of time and energy, but I just hope that students are able to enjoy what they do and not just feel completely overwhelmed 
by feeling like they have to fit certain requirements. So here's an example. When water polo season ended, she joined the swim team. Most school days she would swim from 6 to 7 a.m. After school, she'd go to swim practice, then to play rehearsal until 7 p.m., then go home to study. Wedged in somehow were two band practices a week, plus her Girl Scout meeting, her parents were proud, but she began to focus on how dark it was every morning when she left her house and dark when she came home at night. Speaking of dark, this is where my content warning comes in for self-harm and suicide. I wanna talk about the actual real dangers of being overworked, especially as a high school student. All of this comes at a cost. All of this insane pressure and the time and the commitment and the energy that students are expected to commit to is just too much. And again, even like a top student who seems like they're really responsible and can handle all of these things, it's too much. Nobody should be expected at that age especially to put in this much time and work and expected to be perfect, expected to get top grades and be able to balance all of these other activities. The habits that many students feel pressured into are deeply unhealthy mentally and physically. So that schedule that I read from was this student, her name is Taylor, and she attempted suicide in 2002 when she was a freshman in high school. So she ended up in therapy and realized that she had been suffering from depression and the dangers of not sleeping enough. So in this situation, basically, she lost her ability to think clearly, and instead of thinking, okay, I need to talk to my parents, tell them I need to quit some activities, do something, she felt that self-destruction was the only option. So this is from an article called the Silicon Valley Suicides. In Palo Alto, there were two specific schools where their suicide rates were just way higher than the average. The 10 year suicide rate for the two high schools is between four and five times the national average. And a lot of that was due to the extreme stress that all of the students were under. And then of course, there's always a threat that one suicide could trigger others or make other vulnerable students consider suicide. So it's a very, very um, dangerous situation. So part of why this is so shocking is because this is an affluent community and these kids are very high achieving. So I guess some people assume that wealth and privilege, talent, somehow protect you from any types of self-harm, but clearly that is not the case. An assistant professor in Yale's psychiatry department wanted to know whether misbehavior correlated more with poverty or with a stage of adolescence. In the inner city school, 86% of students received free or reduced price lunches. In the suburban school, 1% did. Yet in the richer school, the proportion of kids who smoked, drank, or used hard drugs was significantly higher, as was the rate of serious anxiety and depression. She created a profile of elite American adolescents whose self-worth is tied to their achievements and who see themselves as catastrophically flawed if they don't meet the highest standards of success. Elite education manufactures students who are smart and talented and driven, yes, but also anxious, timid, and lost with little intellectual curiosity and a stunted sense of purpose. So in case you had thought that maybe I was being unfair to, I guess, more privileged wealthy students, I definitely acknowledge that they have their own stress and pressures to deal with. I wouldn't want any students to go under that level of stress, regardless of what your socioeconomic situation is. The fact that so many students are becoming deeply depressed and suicidal and mentally unhealthy in all of these ways due to school pressure or pressure from their parents or just all of it. The pressure to succeed and be perfect and excel in all ways is just too much. Anyway, I've been recording for way too long and I don't even know if this video made sense because by the time I plan these videos and then go through them and then say them, I don't know. I don't know what I've said. But it is clear that, again, the culture of toxic productivity is everywhere. It is in the workforce, it is in adults, it is in students and kids, and it's really bad. It's horrible for all of us. It's really, really dangerous at its worst. Once again, stay tuned for my next videos. I wanna talk about gifted students, and I wanna talk about college, work-life balance, AKA the lack of it. It's crazy, it's overwhelming, and if you related to any of this, I want you to know that you deserve a break and you need to take care of your health first and foremost. I know it's really hard to put down your barriers, I guess, and not continue to aspire to these perfect standards. But again, your health and your well-being is most important. So please give yourself rest and please, please, please sleep 
you need it. Okay, that is all. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you would like to follow me on Instagram for some mediocre pictures, you can do that. And make sure you subscribe if you enjoyed this video and stay tuned for future internet analysis videos. Okay, thanks, bye.